This is the new 2024 Mercedes-Benz E-Class, and it's the fully redesigned new version of Mercedes midsize E-Class luxury car, which first came out decades ago. I know better than anybody because I have owned five earlier E-Class models representing every single one of this car's previous generations. I'm a bit of an E-Class expert. And now the new one is here with updated technology and improved color comfort and refinement and new styling. And today I'm going to review the new E-Class and show you all of its quirks and features. Today's video is brought to you by Cars and Bids, my online enthusiast car auction site that recently sold this and this and this and this and this. All right, time for the quirks and features of the new E-Class. And first, a thank you to Mercedes-Benz of Temecula for providing me with this new E-Class to review. Mercedes-Benz of Temecula is my local Mercedes-Benz dealership here in the San Diego area. They have all of the latest Mercedes-Benz models, including the new E-Class, which is just coming out. Check out Mercedes-Benz of Temecula at the link below. But with that in mind, let's talk new E-Class and specifically models. This car is making its debut for the 24 model year in two versions. The base model is called the E350 and it comes with a two liter turbocharged four cylinder engine that also has a mild hybrid component. The result is 255 horsepower and the E350 starts around $63,300. Or if you want more power, more muscle, you can step up to this one, the E450, which has a three liter turbocharged six cylinder engine, also with a mild hybrid component. Now, that engine makes about 375 horsepower, and as you can see, it has a plastic engine cover with six lines on it to denote six cylinders, because that's just what you have to do, apparently. Now, the E450 starts around $69,100. That's the new E-Class lineup for now, but like I said, more models are coming. There will be a wagon version in addition to the sedan. That means the return of the E450 all-terrain. That is my normal everyday car, the previous generation. That's coming back for the new one. And a new E63 AMG model will also come back, although it will almost surely get rid of the V8 that the previous model had in favor of some turbocharged hybrid six-cylinder engine report with something like 700 horsepower. The full details aren't out yet on the E63, but it's coming, likely in sedan and wagon form. So with the basics out of the way, let's talk through the quirks and features of the new E-Class, although I must provide a disclaimer, this car is not really intended to be quirky. That's not the point of the E-Class. For decades now, this car has provided reliable, reasonably sized and priced luxury transportation for people who want to be understated and subtle and just have a simple simple, quiet, comfortable existence. They don't want flash or craziness or excitement, and the E-Class for years has delivered that. But in an era where Tesla cars, you can now replace the horn sound with clapping applause, Mercedes decided they had to do some things to make this car more fun, and so they have. For example, the taillights now have the Mercedes-Benz three-pointed star logo integrated into them. You can see a nice little hidden Easter Easter egg to provide a little bit of excitement back here. In front, the grill is all a bunch of Mercedes-Benz logos when you get closer. It's all a bunch of little three-pointed stars that again add a little excitement and a little character. The door handles are flush with the body of the car until you walk up and unlock it, and then they pop out, which is cool. And the Mercedes-Benz script appears on the inside. They decided to add a little bit of flair, but that was about it. Otherwise, on the outside of this car, it is fairly traditional and fairly tame like previous E-Class models have been. In fact, this particular redesign was not a significant one from a styling perspective. It looks a lot like the outgoing model and not dramatically different like previous E-Class models have been. This one is more of an evolution and it sticks with the general E-Class theme of slow and steady 
and understated and restrained. That's the E-Class, now with a little bit more flair. Now, with that said, although the exterior hasn't changed dramatically compared to the previous E-Class, the interior is substantially overhauled and very different than the one you had in the outgoing model. Undoubtedly, the largest difference on the inside is the Hyper Screen, which is an optional screen that stretches the entire way across the dashboard. You can see there's the Gauge Cluster screen, then next to that you have the Center Infotainment Touch screen, and then Next to that, you have a third screen that has a bunch of flying Mercedes-Benz stars. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. This third screen does have a purpose. It's for the passenger to use. It can only be activated if there's someone sitting in the passenger seat. And when you're here, you turn it on and then you have access to, well, basically all of the exact same controls you have in the center, but now they're approximately 11 inches closer to you over on the passenger side. <laughs> That's not entirely true. You do have a few additional controls over here. For example, you can activate Bluetooth for headphones so that you can listen to your own music in the front passenger seat. But mostly all of the controls you see in the passenger screen are mirrored in the center screen. It just means you have a slightly smaller reach. But it's here, the hyper screen, the massive screen across this entire interior. And I gotta say, that giant screen, frankly, looks pretty cool. Tesla shows up with their big center screen and that sets the entire car industry on fire. Well, now Mercedes has one that goes across the whole interior. Take that, Tesla. It'll be interesting to see just how big the screens get in these cars. But anyway, the other cool thing that the hyper screen creates is an interesting climate vent situation. You have this large climate vent basically going over the entire top of the screen, which looks cool. And it almost integrates the climate vents as sort of a piece of interior design. Instead of specific vents just sticking out from the dashboard, they're on this sweeping curved panel above the screen. It looks a lot nicer, even though this panel is largely functional with the climate vents integrated. And since we're talking technology in this car, the center screen, the new Mercedes-Benz central infotainment screen is just fantastic. Yes, it is better than Tesla. Yes, I've said it, and it's true. It is huge, it is tremendously responsive, and it's incredibly intuitive, and there's a lot of things that I absolutely love about it. On the main home screen with the map, for example, you have a bunch of floating icons that you can tap on to go to various different menus and settings screens, whatever you want. These icons are always here, so they act like quick shortcuts where you don't have to go into a menu and and then go to your settings page, it's all right here, right on your screen. And yet the screen is large enough that it still gives enough room for you to see exactly what you're trying to see with the displayed map. It's really great integration. And of course, this screen also gives you Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is fantastic. Most people prefer that. And you have a great home widget that instantly pulls up all the apps you'd need to direct basically any commands and controls inside this car, including some game apps which are pretty fantastic. I especially like this one which is a memory game where you identify Mercedes-Benz model cards, you flip it over and then you flip it back and you try to remember where they're placed which is kind of a cool little thing if you're just sitting waiting for someone. There's also a game that roughly mimics air hockey with red pitted against green and then you have a puck in the center and then you have to try to shoot it into the goal before your opponent does and frankly it is surprisingly addictive just sitting here and playing these games which are now integrated into the infotainment screen and easy to find and use. Now on the subject of Mercedes trying to make this car more fun and exciting, those games are definitely an example and here's another one. It comes with a selfie camera. You see this camera that's pointed on the dashboard facing the interior? Well you can activate that as a selfie camera and then take selfies, I guess, as you drive along. Look at all of us hanging out in the Mercedes. That's the theory with that camera, and it certainly does add an element of youthful exuberance to the whole experience. By the way, speaking of cameras, also worth pointing out another great benefit of this center screen, the camera system is just fantastic. The camera system showing all around the car is really great. High resolution cameras, top down, all stitched together beautifully, and you can see basically every angle very quickly with swipes of the fingers. It's a fantastic 
fantastic system. Now, one drawback of this giant center infotainment screen is that it's relatively difficult to access your climate controls to make climate control changes. In order to change the temperature, for instance, you gotta make a tap on the current temperature, and then there's a slider to make the change. Same deal with airflow and various other climate-related things. Now, this is also true in Tesla's giant center screen, so there's not really an advantage with Tesla there, but I think it's generally a drawback, and I prefer what Mercedes-Benz has in the latest S-Class, where all of the climate controls are on a strip on the bottom of the screen, they're fixed there, and you can easily make adjustments without having to double tap to get into an adjustment screen. Also worth pointing out, one other drawback of the center control situation is the volume control. In my car, the previous generation Mercedes E-Class, there's a dial, a physical dial you can use to turn up and down the stereo volume mounted in the center console. In the new E-Class, that physical dial has been replaced with a haptic touch slider, and frankly, it just doesn't work as well. You slide your finger up the volume dial, and it turns it up a little bit, but you got to do a bunch of swipes in order to change the volume a lot, and it's just not the greatest integration compared to a simple, traditional dial, which is what we want. Now, with that said, in this center control area, one thing I love is this button, which pulls up all of your cameras instantly. You're trying to park in a tight space. You don't have to go into the menu to find the cameras. Just tap this button, and they appear all your high-resolution cameras so you can figure it out very quickly. It removes some stress from a potentially high-stress, tight space car situation. Now, the final screen to discuss in this front seat interior space is the gauge cluster screen, which frankly hasn't changed much compared to the previous E-Class and many other Mercedes-Benz models. That said, it didn't really need to. It's excellent. I love how this gauge cluster is tremendously configurable. You basically have three panels, center, left, and right, and you can make them do and show basically anything you want. And you can make this gauge cluster screen focus on one thing if you'd prefer that. If you want to see one item especially large, it'll do that for you. It basically allows you to configure it exactly how you want information to be displayed. More automakers should take a page out of the Mercedes-Benz book and provide as much configuration in their gauge cluster as this one has. It really is among the very best in the car industry. And it can be 3D. With the tap of this icon on the center screen, the gauge cluster becomes 3D. I can't show you this on camera, but basically when you look at it with your regular eyes, there are different levels on the gauge cluster screen. The information is presented at different levels, like the odometer is behind the speedometer and the rest of the readouts, and it's hard to even really explain, but it is showing a 3D screen at the tap of a button, which is a pretty cool thing, and I think a preview of what's coming in the future. As for physical stuff in this interior beyond the screens, there's not really all that much to discuss, because Frankly, this car is mostly controlled with the screens that I just went over, but a few items to note. For one, here in the center console area, you have two storage compartments you can open up and stick stuff in. The one further forward includes cup holders, as you can see, and it also includes a wireless cell phone charger, the base of which is Mercedes-Benz logos. Again, little three-pointed stars you can see if you look in there, but those are your center storage areas. The other notable item is the sunroof control, which is no longer a button or a switch or a dial, but rather a swipey pad. You swipe your finger back and then the sunroof opens. You tap to stop the sunroof from opening, and then you swipe your finger back in the other direction to close it, and you can just swipe forward or backward all day. No more physical buttons, no switch. It's just swipey, swipey to open and close the sunroof. And next up, we move into the back seat of the new E-Class, which is reasonably comfortable and decently sized. I have enough leg room and knee room. I got headroom. It's all fine back here. And as you might imagine, there's nothing really interesting or exciting to report. This is after all, the back seat of a Mercedes-Benz E450. Now, there are a few items worth mentioning. You have climate vents back here, and then there's a little storage compartment below the climate vents, so it looks like the whole thing is making a weird face. I suspect some E-Class models will have climate controls back here, which would take the place of this storage compartment, but this one doesn't. Instead, it has a gaping mouth 
for the face. I also suspect some E-Class models will have heated and cooled rear seats, but this one doesn't, just a fairly basic traditional back seat. And if you want cup holders, just like in a lot of cars, you fold down the center armrest. You can see it's an armrest, or if you push this little panel, it pops out once to give you a little slot where you can put a pen or your phone, and then you push it a second time and it pops out to reveal the cup holders. Mercedes-Benz has been making E-Class back seats for 35, 40, 40 years now, and they've never really been interesting. This one continues that, but it's very functional. Does exactly what you'd expect. And finally, we move on to the cargo area, the trunk of the new Mercedes E-Class, which is, well, the trunk of a Mercedes E-Class. Not particularly exciting or surprising, but I will show it to you anyway. It is reasonably large, as you can see. There's a decent amount of cargo space back here, which is pretty nice. You also have extra cargo space under the floor. You lift this up, and there's some more space there, and extra space on the sides, which is nice. And you have this little handle on the trunk ceiling you can pull down, and then some hooks reveal themselves. You can use them to hang grocery bags. You also have switches back here you can use to drop the rear seats. They fold down in order to create a larger passage through the trunk for larger items. None of that stuff is particularly exciting or interesting or cutting edge, but again, this is the trunk of a Mercedes-Benz E-Class. It is what you'd expect, and it's good. It's fine. Also worth pointing out, you have power-operated trunk closer. You push a button. Ow! Oh! Just kidding, it comes down and closes. All right, driving the new Mercedes-Benz E450. And I gotta tell you, this isn't just consumer advice for you. Given that I have owned all previous E-Class generations, I am not really in the market for a new car, I'm not thinking, but I just assume that at some point I will have one of these too. So this is consumer advice for me as well. As a result, this is a very important review. I am reviewing this car to tell myself whether I want one, not just you. So sitting in here, first thing I noticed, very quiet. This is one of the things I like the most about my 22 model. It is just so quiet and composed with levels that used to only really be possible in an S-Class, but now in a fairly standard traditional, you know, mine is like a middle tier mid-spec E-Class, it feels just that same level of comfortable and quiet. Now this particular E-Class is an E450 that has the same powertrain that I have in my car, but with a little extra power for the new version. Uh, I love this engine in my car, and it feels good here, although I have to say it doesn't quite feel as pokey and responsive. It's kind of interesting. It's almost like the accelerator pedal specifically and like the initial throttle tip-in has been tuned to make it feel a little bit more solid and a little slower like old Mercedes-Benz models and a little bit like less potent and pokey which actually is one of the things I like about my car but maybe some people buying a luxury Mercedes-Benz don't. Generally speaking though this engine is absolutely fantastic. Mercedes has done a great job of downsizing in cylinder count to increase fuel economy and decrease emissions while still maintaining the feel of the old cylinder count. So this six cylinder does feel like those old E500s and E550s with the V8. The hybrid powertrain is supposed to fill in for the turbo lag that happens with turbocharged engines and make it feel like there is no lag and that there is great torque. And that is exactly what happens with this powertrain. You feel like you have excellent torque in the mid range, much more than you would expect from a six cylinder. And the engine is very responsive, aside from, like I mentioned, that slight initial throttle tip in change. One thing I do notice, the steering feels sharper than in my car. It feels uh, quicker to steer and change direction. It doesn't feel like the handling is any better, um, like the car actually goes around corners any faster, but sharp steering is becoming kind of a hallmark that people are looking for in cars. It makes them feel like they're in a sporty car, even if the car doesn't actually handle any better. Um, and that is the case here. This car does have the steering is nice and quick and responsive, more so than in mine. In terms of ride quality, I love the ride quality in my car fantastically. This one is just as good, if not maybe a little bit better. It's kind of hard to tell, but it is really, really excellent. Just a nice, comfortable place to be and a comfortable place to spend time, which really has become kind of the growing ethos of the Mercedes-Benz E-Class. It's just a great all-around vehicle in terms of sizing, technology, equipment, and even pricing when you compare it to you know, S-Class and other top-spec high-end luxury models. I do love the hyperscreen. I've driven now several cars with either the hyperscreen or at least this large center screen component, uh, and it's fantastic. Mercedes infotainment is 
among the very, very best in the industry, if not the very best. And the latest stuff is even better. And it's crazy that with every couple model years, they come out with something that's even, even better. I, I feel like the system I have in my 22 model is a fantastic one, and yet they continue to refine. It's great, it's very responsive, and when you're sitting here, it looks good having these big screens in front of you. The 3D thing looks fantastic. It's, it's, it's wonderful stuff. And to that end, I will say uh, the interior is a big upgrade compared to what I have in my E-Class, the, the previous generation car. On the outside, I don't think it looks all that different, uh, but on the inside, it really is a totally different affair with all of Mercedes-Benz sort of latest technology, um, you know, crammed in here and, and made to feel a lot newer and nicer. The thing about E-Class is that they improve incrementally because it's such a great just generalist vehicle that it's hard to make giant leaps at this point. I think the one drawback here is that I do wish the exterior styling was a little different. Um, it's a pretty small upgrade from the, the previous one to the new one. And I think previous E-Class models, there have been some bigger leaps in design, which makes you want to go out and get the new one. You want your neighbors to see, you want your friends, you want every, you want to know, I got this new car. Now it doesn't really look all that different. Uh, and frankly, the rest of the car is just sort of pulled slightly forward as well. So to an extent, I think I, I wish they had just taken things a little bit further, but you know, this car is kind of the standard of this midsize luxury, comfortable sedan segment. It always has been, it still is. The new one is a little bit better than before. Um, and it remains just a, a great and excellent car, even if maybe it could have used a little bit more uh, of kind of a modern design language. And so that's the new 2024 Mercedes-Benz E-Class. I am an E-Class connoisseur. I've owned five previous generations of this car, and I'm not surprised to say that this one continues the tradition of excellence. It may not be the most exciting, the most thrilling or daring car, but it falls in line and delivers exactly what you'd expect from an E-Class. Understated luxury, great comfort, good technology, no surprise. And now it's time to give the new E-Class a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 61 out of 100, which places the new E-Class here against some similar cars. This is a very solid score, and it beats out or equals virtually all rivals, which makes sense. This is an excellent car that does it all well. It's not exactly thrilling, but there will be a high-performance AMG version for that. For regular people doing regular driving, the new E-Class is comfortable, smooth, roomy, high-tech, and handsome. With that said, even as a longtime E-Class owner, I slightly prefer the new BMW 5 Series for its styling, technology, and driving experience. But both are excellent cars.